the love of the Father, the peace of the Lord Jesus, the joy of the Spirit of God be upon you. And may He grant you all the days of your life the grace, the mercy, and the loving kindness to follow Him wherever you go, whatever you do, and however you are. May He be unto you our God. Colossians 1, chapter 1 reading through to chapter 2. This letter is from Paul, chosen by God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and from our brother Timothy. It is written to God's holy people in the city of Colossae, who are faithful brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. May God our Father give you grace and peace. We always pray for you and we give thanks to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. For we have heard that you trust in Christ Jesus and that you love all of God's people. You do this because you are looking forward to the joys of heaven as you have been ever since you first heard the truth of the good news. This same good news that came to you is going out to all over the world. It is changing lives everywhere, just as it changed yours that very first day you heard and understood the truth about God's great kindness to sinners. Epaphras, our much beloved co-worker, was the one who brought you the good news. He is Christ's faithful servant, and he is helping us in your place. He is the one who told us about the great love for others that the Holy Spirit has given you. So we have continued praying for you ever since we first heard about you. We ask God to give you a complete understanding of what He wants you to do in your lives as we ask Him to make you wise with spiritual wisdom. Then that way you live will always honor and please the Lord and you will continually do good. You will do kind things for others. All the while, you will learn to know God better and better. We also pray that you will be strengthened with His glorious power so that you will have the patience and the endurance that you need. May you be filled with joy, always thanking the Father who has enabled you to share the inheritance that belongs to God's holy people, who live in the light as He is in the light. For he has rescued us from the one who rules in the kingdom of darkness. And he has brought us into the kingdom of his dear son. God has purchased our freedom with his blood and has forgiven all our sins. Christ, Jesus, is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before God made anything at all. And he is supreme over all of creation. Jesus is the one through whom God created everything in heaven and in earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see. Kings, kingdoms, rulers and authorities, everything has been created through him and for him. He existed before anything else began and he holds all creation together. Christ is the head of the church which is his body. He is the first of all who will rise from the dead. So he is first in everything and he has risen from the dead. For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Jesus and by him God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and everything on earth by means of his blood Christ Jesus on the cross. This includes you who were once so far away from God. You were his enemies. You were separated from him by your evil thoughts and your worst actions. Yet now he has brought you back as his friends. He has done this through his death on the cross in his own human body. As a result, he has brought you into the very presence of God and you are now holy and blameless 
as you stand before him without a single fault. But you must continue to believe this truth and to stand in it firmly. For it is grace that you are saved, by grace you should believe. I added that last part. Let's just go back. But you must continue to believe this truth and stand in it firmly. Don't drift away from the assurance you received when you heard the good news. The good news has been preached all over the world, and I, Paul, have been appointed by God to proclaim it. I am glad when I suffer for you in my body. For I am completing that which remains of Jesus' sufferings for his body, the church. God has given me the responsibility of serving his church by proclaiming his message in all its fullness to you, Gentiles. This message was kept secret for centuries and generations past, but now it has been revealed to his own holy people. For it has pleased God to tell his people that the riches and glory of Jesus are for you Gentiles also, and in him the Gentiles shall trust. And I added that. For this is the secret, that Jesus lives in you, and this is your assurance that you will share in his glory. Jesus lives in you. And I added that. So everywhere we go, we tell everyone about Jesus. We warn them, teach them, with all wisdom God has given us, for we want to present them to God, mature and perfect, in their relationship to Jesus. I work very hard at this as I depend upon Christ's mighty power that works within me. Even so, let it be so, O Lord our God, as we've listened to your word, as we've heard, as it were, that which you would speak to us, that which you would say to us, and that which you want us to know. May your word go forth to all of us who have ears to hear what your spirit is saying to us as we now ask, O oh God, that you teach us, that you be the guide to provide for us learning and application, that you by your providence, that you by your mercy, that you by your loving kindness would give unto us that meat that we need for this day, as well as that milk that we need along the way. That you would be the good news that we provide for you to allow us to go forth and to declare what you have done and revealed through us. Because God, it is good news that you have given us. And God, it is what we want and desire to learn from and to know about your good news for us. And God, it is that which we will proclaim always, the good news that Jesus has died, that Jesus has risen, that Jesus is coming again. So God, fill us now by thy Spirit with your great grace that you've given us, that the Spirit of God might allow us to know what it is you want us to hear. So in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. And I know you know, Jesus is coming very soon. So looking at Colossae, we know that the Colossians are gone. Because, quite frankly, they're no longer there. But we know that this is written for our benefit, because we likewise know that the Spirit of God gives life to the Word of God. We are told that without the Spirit of God, we could not understand what we just read, and we could not apply what we just heard. As a matter of fact, without there being the Spirit of God to teach us, we could not know anything about God except that it be revealed to us, for God is a Spirit. And they that worship Him, not only to know Him, but those that want to know Him must worship Him in spirit and truth, but they also must have spiritual understanding. They must comprehend what are the things of the Spirit, what are the things of God which are not carnal. As a matter of fact, you can take this and you can apply it to your life. If it's practical, it's probably not spiritual. Now that makes perfect sense, doesn't it? If it's practical, it's probably not spiritual because it applies to the practicalities of life. But if it's spiritual, it will incorporate the practical. Do you see what I just said? If it's spiritual, it will incorporate the practical because you see, what we deal with in practicalities is what we call the things that we can see, the things that we can hear, and the things that we can handle with our own hands. Those are the things that most people call practical. It's practically speaking. It's something that we say, I see it, 
I touch it, I feel it, I know it. But God can't be seen, touched, or felt. Or can He? You see, for me, we are just told in Colossians that God can be seen, that God can be heard, that God can be touched. Because Jesus Himself said to His disciples in Matthew, as well as in other locations in the Gospel, that if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. And now we have that confirmed by Paul writing to the Colossians. As a matter of fact, it says that Jesus is the express image of God. This same good news came into you going out to all over the world that changed your lives everywhere. In 115, we see Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God. Now that blows my mind. Because in Him do we know that God dwelt bodily and in fullness. That means that of the Spirit of God coming into Jesus, that became more than human because Jesus came and gave up His deity to be for us the Son of Man. But being that God came inside Him and lived in Him, He became also the Son of God in revealing and taking unto Himself sin so that we would be forgiven. One of the things that I find interesting about all that is that it all sounds, practically speaking, from a theological point of view, very intellectual, doesn't it? It sounds really important when you put it into that kind of perspective when you're talking about the esoteric kind of like spiritual realities that go on somewhere out here, but don't mean much right here. What does that mean to me today? How does that fit in my life right now in the way that I'm living my life? What can I take out of Colossians to put into practice today by living every day as though it were written to Michael? Not Colossians, but Michael. What is this book for you to become today real so that it can be alive and living? So that it could be something that's not just doing my spiritual duty, but rather discovering and revealing and reveling in that with which God is doing in my life today. Let's look at it and see. This letter is from Paul, chosen by God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus, from our brother Timothy, and from our brother Timothy. So Paul and Timothy and I thought Epaphras as we find out later, but Paul, Timothy and Epaphras basically are writing a letter to these guys and they're writing a letter to you. So let me be clear, Paul is chosen by God to be an apostle. He didn't choose, God chose him. God chose Paul to be an apostle of Jesus, not an apostle of the church, not to be an apostle of some other means, venue, religion, doctrine, or dogma. Paul isn't one of the apostles of the twelve. Paul is an apostle of Christ Jesus and from Timothy. So he's writing this letter to let us know where and what is coming from who because he's the apostle but there's also other people that are the witnesses. And as he mentions because there's two people there we know that where two or more are gathered there he is in the midst. Well that likewise is some of the testimony of two or three witnesses then his word is established. And so we see that in verse 2 it is written to God's holy people in the city of Colossae who are faithful brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. One of the things I like about this letter immediately is that Paul establishes that he's writing and he is from the Lord Jesus and that he immediately talks about how faithful and how true or how faithful the brothers and sisters are in Jesus. Because in Jesus is where you're going to find faithfulness. You're not going to find men that are faithful outside of Jesus. You see, you find men that are duty-bound You'll find honorable men, you'll find good men, but you won't find faithful men because faithful men only find themselves by way of the mercy and grace of God's providence doing it in their lives, becoming faithful because God is the one who keeps them faithful. If you notice in verse 1 it says, Paul chosen by God, and then it says, faithful brothers and sisters in Jesus. Both are God. So you could have said in verse 2, in God... Paul was chosen in God, faithful brothers and sisters. That's what we find when we look at the reality of what God is doing in your life. He is making you faithful. He is making you a brother and a sister in Jesus. 
he is making you possibly chosen to be something. Now what you may become is between you and him and he may determine for you to be an apostle. He may determine for you to be a prophet, a teacher, an elder, a deacon, or something else. But he always chooses to use whom he chooses. He always is the one who is in charge of and responsible to doing the work. It doesn't say Paul chosen by the other apostles as they did with one of the other apostles. It doesn't say that these men and women that were in Jesus were faithful because of somebody doing it to them. No, it says that they were faithful because they were in Jesus and that their reputation has come out into the world to let people know that somehow Paul found out, wow, you guys are known to be faithful. You guys are, as a matter of fact, so impressive that I haven't even visited you yet, and yet I am told you're faithful. I have found out that you have the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, and that God has made you to be faithful. You see, that's where a lot of us fail, I think, in our practical day-to-day -day living. We think we have to be faithful to be called faithful. We think we have to do something in order to get something. But you see, Paul is calling them faithful because he heard they were. And where he heard that was probably from the Lord Jesus Christ. The same thing is going to be told of you. You're going to be called faithful because you believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why you're faithful. It has nothing to do with doing the work of the job that you're doing. It has nothing to do with your consistency of the determination of your practicality, doing something dogmatically over and over again and being called faithful for that? No. As far as God is concerned, those are simply robotic exercises of someone doing a dogmatic way and a machinery could do that. You don't call the machinery faithful, do you? As a matter of fact, if a machine operates the same way every day and goes day in and day out and day in and day out and never breaks down, do you call that machine faithful? No. You don't, do you? Now, when you go day by day and day by day, you're called faithful, aren't you? Or are you? You see, we may be misappropriating that word because what God calls faithful is not what man calls faithful. Man calls faithful when he can look at something and say, I am satisfied with it. I am calling or imputing to this person faithfulness. But God looks at you in a different way. God chooses to call you faithful simply because of your faith not because of the fullness of what you think you have done. In other words, it's by your faith and not your works. Because you could do the work steadily over and over and over again and think that you're being faithful to the work that you've been called to do. No, you've been responsible, not faithful. Different terms. Faith, hope, and love are three terms that are spiritual words used in a practical way to demonstrate something that God has done and God is doing to reveal His Son in you and to reveal the Word of God alive and well and living through you. Because you are not faithful, to put it bluntly, in the way that man looks at it. Five minutes or five days or five years, you can prove and demonstrate sooner or later down the road that you were unfaithful when you were already called faithful. And we'll see that even in the Colossians, even in the letters that Paul is writing to them. He'll call them faithful brothers and sisters, but then later show that they have some weaknesses, some strengths and some weaknesses and some unfaithfulness. So here in verse 2, we discover something very interesting about the way God sees things as opposed to the way man sees things. When he wants to say something, he'll use someone to do that. And he's using Paul to speak to the brothers and sisters that are in Jesus about their faith and how it has become full of Jesus and why God is calling them faithful. Because they have done that with which all of us must do to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. We have to have faith in Jesus. Because if we put our faith in anything else, we're merely fooling ourselves and destroying the work of God that is in our lives. So this letter is from Paul, chosen by God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus, and from our brother Timothy, because it is written to God's holy people in the city of Colossae, who are faithful brothers and sisters in Jesus. May God our Father give you grace and peace. Oh my God.
God. You see, we are told so often uh, in this age of grace that we live in that we've been given grace and that it is a free gift, not of ourselves, lest any man should boast, but it is a gift from God. And yet, we're having Paul pray and bestow upon someone grace. Now, what exactly then are we saying? Are we objectifying the personification of that redemption quality of sanctification that God has accomplished through His Son, Jesus Christ, by the being propitiation for our sins, and that that is the grace that we talk about? No. And yet it's the same word. You see, that grace that, that I just mentioned and defined in spiritual terms is the definition of the subject matter of the object of grace, but not grace itself. Grace is simply a demonstration of the act of love that God is using to give to you love. If he says grace to you, he's saying love unto you with forgiveness. You see, grace means that it's extending to you some favor, some ability you don't have of yourself to be able to be even in the presence of the person that's bestowing the grace. It's usually used in a court of law or a court of, we should say, power or authority. In a place and a position of authority, if you find yourself submitted to being in the presence of a higher authority or a higher power or someone greater than you are, then if you barge in to their presence without asking first, then if they don't extend grace to you, they likely could annihilate you according to most typical courts and you would not be justified in thinking that there was any reason for you to have any recourse except to find yourself guilty of interrupting the presence of that higher power, higher authority, that king, that prophet, that priest, that, that uh, God that you're worshiping or that God that you've interrupted. We see that in the book of Esther and it's taught very clearly there that if Esther, when she presented herself to the king, if he didn't extend the scepter to her and say, hey, grace be unto you, she was dead. She could not come before the king without being summoned first. A lot of times that's what the church used to be like. The church used to be a lot like that. It would not come to God, but would see, be distant and petition God and say, you know, well, help, you know, be far away rather than intimate. God has given us something else, a better way, a more excellent way with which we can approach Him. It's by grace that He says, I will give you grace if you will come to me. In other words, my grace is upon you so that you can enter my presence. Now I'll give you more grace if you will extend that grace to someone else. Grace for grace are we given so that we would be able to use that grace to have others come with us to the Father to receive mercy and grace. So that's why Paul says it right there is because we want to go someplace, we want to do something, and we want to accomplish something which is peace with God. Grace and peace be unto you, is what Paul is saying, and may the may God our Father give you that grace and peace. Because if God the Father has given you peace, Jesus said it this way, My peace I give unto you, not as the world gives, give I unto you. My peace passes all understanding. In the world you shall have tribulation, but my peace will overcome that. You will have complete assurance in the peace I give unto you. Because that peace is a demonstration of the action of the fruit of the Spirit working in your life. It is the manifestation of that personification of who the Holy Spirit is as He grows up in you, His Word, accomplishing that life that He said you would have, which would be the life of Jesus alive and well, living in you. That it would be a supernatural life, a spiritual life that is coming from the inside, shining to the outside, to reveal even in your actions, your words, your deeds, and the very face you have, the glory of the Lord. You would become that tabernacle in this world that would be the outer garments of dead badger skins, your flesh being deadened unto the works that you were doing, but rather your spirit would be alive unto the work of God that is being accomplished in you, both to do, do and to will of his good pleasure, that you are not his hands and feet. Oh, no. You are the workmanship of God created in Christ Jesus 
to accomplish His will and His purpose and design in this life. For you are His workmanship created for good works in Christ Jesus that you would demonstrate the peace, the joy, and the love of having relationship with God. That's the interrelationship that we have with the Word of God and our spirit. The Word of God goes inside and causes our spirit to be quickened and made alive. That is why faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. It is not enough to read and reprogram because we do read in order to change our mindset into that receptacle with which we can be filled with the Holy Spirit so that He could give us ears to hear. Because our mind needs to be cleared of all that which we have seen, all that which we have heard and handled in the outer practicalities of life, so that we could get to the reality of the things of the Spirit that the Holy Spirit wants to show us that we can see in the very same things we saw on the surface, He can show beneath the surface what's really going on inside of that which we think has happened to us. Circumstances in your life are one of those realities. Grace and peace from our Lord Jesus Christ and from the Father be unto you. May the peace of God show you this and reveal to you how your circumstances are being used by God to reveal peace to you. Oh, you may think that they are devastating in the sense of you lost your house, you lost your car, you lost your wife, you lost your child. But God wants to demonstrate His love towards you in that while you were yet suffering, there was peace beneath the surface. Because you see, on the surface, this outer anguish and angst with which you have of your flesh, beneath the surface, you know by your peace of God that should you have lost a wife or a child in Jesus, in God, you know you shall see them again. For even as we are absent from the body, we will be present with the Lord, so too, when we go to see the Lord, we know we shall see our loved ones too, for they shall be with Him and we shall be like him, and he will have brought them unto himself, even as he promised he would go and prepare a place for us, so that he would prepare a place for you, so that you would be there with your loved ones, and with he whom you have focused your love upon, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the good news is really that. We're going to see in this book, all the way through it, the, the repeating circle of grace, peace, mercy, and good news, that these faithful brothers and sisters have and that you should employ in your life. That you could know that you have peace with God because of grace that you couldn't get any other way because you could not have asked for grace, you could not have been given grace except for God reached down and spoke to you and said, you come here. You I will give grace to. You have been chosen. I choose you today. I choose you to give my grace to. I choose you to give the good news to. I have given you my life. I have given you my son. I have spoken to you by my spirit. It is your choice to live according to my will and my way. I have proven that I am love. I am demonstrating that I am peace. I am more than open to show you my grace. Will you not now find in me satisfaction to follow me, to know me face to face? And so the Lord reaches down to us in many ways and wants to speak to us purely, sufficiently, succinctly, directly through his word. He wants to make sure that we get the most out of the utmost that we have so that God's spirit could reveal to every single person, human being and alive, that right here in his word, especially to you, you call it, you Colossian, because that's what you are. When you are going through this today, as you read this, as you bang your head against the wall and go your way, sometimes frustrated by the things you see and the things you say, you're going to discover that you are a Colossian, that you're faithful, that you should take from this two verses, Something very acutely spoken by God to you. One, you're chosen. Very interesting. God chose you. Yeah, He chose you. You've been chosen for salvation. Many are called, but you're chosen. 
Not only that, He sees you as you are, but He calls you faithful. And that's not because of your duties that you've done, and it's not because you failed and you succeeded. And it's not because of your works of righteousness that you think you may have done since you've been saved, because you've been doing these things like going faithfully to church, or going dutifully to church, or going religiously to church, or going dogmatically to church, or pragmatically to church, or all those ways that are outward manifestations of something that's going on on the inside, which could be guilt, likewise. But God calls you faithful because of His Son. Because of the faith you have in what God has done, He makes you full of faith and calls you faithful. He does the work. You receive the glory. You receive the blessing, I should say, not the glory. He receives the glory. He has done the work. You receive the blessing. He receives the glory. Because it is the glory of God to work on you, in you, and to accomplish His purposes, not because He needs you for anything at all. There's nothing that you can do for Him. There's nothing you can do about Him, and there's nothing that you can actually add to His own nature, because He is love, and He's the embodiment of pure love in and of itself, that His Son reveals that to us by looking at Jesus. There's nothing that anyone could do for Jesus. Jesus has all things and by him were all things created, and in him all things had their being. So, in that kind of respect to God Almighty, in that kind of awesome supremacy of the great God and King of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who God himself has said to call him Father. Oh, wow. How ought we to be, but full of faithfulness to see the good news that we have someone, something, a God who is so greater than our comprehension could ever state who, what, or how He is, so magnificent and munificent that He is doing all the work for us, that He is giving to us, as Colossians, the greatest compliments that we could possibly have but to know the good news and to find that we are faithful and true, chosen by God because of what He has done. And the simple fact of the matter is that we have just been exercising something He started in us, something He began a good work that He's going to complete until the day of salvation. And that is the good news that He is making you faithful. You never thought of yourself as a Colossian, did you? Well, let me put it to you this way. How about, instead of thinking yourself as a Colossian, how about you think of yourself as chosen? How about today you walk away from this study realizing that by the Spirit of God, by the Word of God, by the good news that you've heard and made real in your life by asking God to take over your life, that you now have been called faithful simply for that one act that you did, the one act that made all the difference in heaven and in hell, in eternity and in temp the temporal, meaning the day in the hour right now that we live. The one act that you did, which was to call upon the name of the Lord, and you were saved. As soon as you were willing to humble yourself and admit that you were a sinner, as soon as you were willing to give of yourself and admit that you couldn't do it anymore, as soon as you were willing to realize that there's a heaven and a hell and you can't figure out how to get to either one, that you needed help from someone else or somewhere else, God reached out to you and said, I will be your God and you will be my people. And you asked and received. And that is the good news. That's the great news that God has given that if you would but ask, you shall receive. If you would but come unto the Lord Jesus Christ, He will save you. Now, will you be saved the moment you ask? I don't know. But I'll tell you this, you'll know. When you know, you know. When you don't know, you don't know. So what difference will it make? Ask. Ask and you shall receive, Jesus said. Seek and you shall find, knock and the door shall be open. But the most important thing was to call. Anyone and everyone that has a testimony will tell you. Well, almost everyone. But some people actually, when they, as soon as they ask, they knew they were saved. They were like, wow, you know, some miraculous spectacular kind of experience, like me. <laughs> but some people, hey, they asked lots of times. They had certain altar calls. 
they had certain sinner's prayer. They said certain things. And other people just went, well, I just kind of think I've been saved all along. You know, and they probably have. I think they have, and I think they are. Because even the Colossians, Paul hadn't been there yet, but he was able to say, you are faithful. You are. And that's what I want to say to you now. If you have some doubt, if you have some fear or some worry that somehow you've been plagued by some kind of like idea that you weren't saved right or you didn't have the right kind of baptism or you didn't get the right gospel or you're not going to the right church, let me be clear with you about something. There's no wrong way to get saved. You're saved, period. As soon as God reached out and grabbed you and held you in the palm of his hand and said, this, oh, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. This is my child as I am making them up to be. This is my daughter of whom I have died and given the life that I lived on the world for. This is whom I have chosen. You are the one he chose. Have that assurance. Have that knowledge. Have that great reassurance from the Word of God that you are, by the grace and peace that He's given you from our Father in heaven, His chosen, His one, you are the one that is faithful.